Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Open Mic here, of course, on the John Campy YouTube channel. Open Mic, of course, is a more kind of laid back version. It's the show where all we do is is hear from you guys. It is, after all, an open mic where we just take your comments, questions, and Rob not turning off his speakers. So... <laughs> Always something. It's always something. So uh, we are so glad you're joining us here today. Of course, I'm joined by Robert Meyer Burnett. I was, before we went on, I was watching the bathroom fight from Mission Impossible. And before that, the All Quiet on the Western Front trailer. And the All Quiet on the Western Front trailer. Which is powerful. It is powerful. It looks, I mean, it looks amazing. Yeah. And uh, we're actually out here on the big set today just because we were too lazy to move things over on Studio B, which we'll probably do most of the time, but <laughs> we're just out here today. So yeah, guys, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take your comments and questions, your thoughts, theories, opinions, and whatever, all that kind of stuff. Just send them on in. Uh, we are only going to have the Super Chats open for another couple of minutes so uh, because you guys have pretty much... 80 90 percent already filled them all up so uh just got they're open for a couple more minutes if you have a thought theory opinion question whatever you'd like us to address now's your time to fire it on in now before we get to that stuff i, I as we like to do here on open mic we'd like to start off by kind of just going back to one of the topics we discussed yeah. earlier on the john campus show maybe cover talk about a couple things maybe we didn't bring up earlier and i thought today what we do is talk about the emmys in particular the, the two shows that won, Succession for Best Drama, Ted Lasso for Best Comedy. And, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier, Rob, about, you know, that, hey, listen, uh, there are a number of the shows that could have won. Succession is truly a deserving winner. Ted Lasso is truly deserving winner. Not that there weren't a couple of other shows that sure. would have been perfectly good if they won too. But as in every award show, there's always the talk of snubs. Snubs. about you know the, the my pick didn't win sort of thing so I, I mean but so i thought we would go back and take a look at these a little bit more yeah. in depth right because a question i thought we should have brought up today that i didn't is if not succession who and if not ted lasso who so let's take a look again at, at the shows that were up mm. these were the shows that were nominated for best drama series it was of course succession which did win now, and that's one succession has won before has it not i believe it has yes yeah so the other nominees were yellow jackets stranger things squid game severance ozark euphoria and better call saul um so let me put it over to you rob let's say you're an you're an emmy voter and let's say for whatever reason you had to remove succession from your ballot mm. Who out of that list, Better Call Saul, Euphoria, Ozark, Severance, I think I know what you're going to say, Squid Game, Stranger Things, or Yellow Jackets, what do you think, who are you giving the vote to? You know, and I'm going to say this, having not watched the whole the whole series, I only watched a few episodes of the first season, tapped out because I wanted to do what I did with the first show in that series, which was is Better Call Saul. I haven't even seen Better Call Saul, but if it's anything like Breaking Bad, obviously it's a phenomenal show, people love it, and it seems... You know, John, this might seem strange, but the fact that Succession wins multiple times and then a show that's been nominated for 40-plus Emmys and has never won anything doesn't win seems kind of odd. And, like, you know, if a, if a show wins an Emmy for Best Emmy, there's for no reason. Best Emmy. I mean, for, for Best Emmy. <laughs> you win the Emmy for you Best win the Emmy. Emmy. <laughs> well, you know, if, you, <laughs> if a show wins the Emmy for Best Show multiple times... I almost think that, like, okay, you've already won. So we'll, we know that you're the best show. That's not the way it should be. I, I, that I know, is but, not the way but, it should be. But here's be. the thing. I mean, it's like. If you're the best show, the you win best show. It doesn't matter if you won best show 85 other times. I know, but. but and but, if you, do, if you want an Emmy, earn it. Don't get it handed to you because the other guy of, won more of already. Of course, I understand that. But you sit there and you go, I think to myself, I'm like, okay. So Succession is a great show. But. You know, so are a lot of those other shows sure. as well. And and I'm like, how do you decide whether one show is better than another? You know, and if one's already won, how is, if it's already won, you know it's already good. But remember, so, th this isn't this isn't like a movie. This is, now we're talking about a whole, every year it's a brand new slate. It's a brand know, new season I of know. that show. And it's, the question that you that you asked as a voter is, which one? Did you think, forget what won before, what didn't won before, which 
season out of all these shows i know did the best job to you as as an individual subjective viewer and voter and you just got to vote with which one you thought was best yeah i mean i guess you do but there's if i like a show i like a show but but it's like is this season better a better season like not every show i don't think every season of a show is exactly the same i agree and i i just think that like there's a lot of i mean i guess it really doesn't matter but this year in both categories there are some like how do you look at squid game against a show like succession yeah totally different kinds of shows completely there's absolutely and they entertain me in different ways yep so how do you look at shows like that and go huh now i understand i mean i understand the, what you're saying but they're both i can't imagine squid game being better than it was for what it was and it's weird but I guess that's just award shows. But I mean, but we do that as well, right? Even just as not just as pundits, but as fans. Like we sure. we look at two different movies and say, well, I actually preferred that movie over that movie. But I mean, that's without getting into the nitty gritty of, of the 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 existential question. But how do we say one is better than the other? You know what I mean? Well, I think but with movies, it's kind of apparent, like to me, for instance, Oscar movies. I think that Oscar movies should have an indelible quality of, in a way, timelessness. Right. Or 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 have basic human truths inherently in them somewhere they have to have some kind of import and uh, like a tv show like succession is kind of about the same thing it's incredibly well done i would not expect that those people the same team it's going to be great but they're dealing with the same issue i mean the show's called succession that's what it's about you know but when you get something like squid game that has nothing. To, it's so different. Like I, I, I. It seems strange that Succession would win twice, and it's the same show. I mean, well, I know it's, every show is the same show. But I mean, it's going to be great. I mean, I know it's going to be great. So a, a show like of Squid Game is so wildly original that I would vote for Squid Game over Succession if it had already won because I already know Succession is good. I, I, I. I think that is very odd reasoning. That, but, I mean, I mean, it just because the, the question. I think you're overcomplicating the question. The question just would be to you as the voter: is here's the list of our nominees. Right. Which one did you think was best and th this season? This one because we've all seen shows that like were terrible the first two or three seasons, and then all of a sudden, season three was like, oh my god, amazing. So you're looking at each individual season, see which season. What to you was best? I know, I know. I but I that, that, I'm just. And if you look, think I'm that just, Squid Game, I'm just nothing philosophically wrong with that. ruminating over the fact that a show like Succession, I would not expect it to be anything other than great. You know, if it, I, all but I we've seen it, lots of shows that, that have had good seasons, bad sure, seasons, no, I, right? I, I, absolutely. But like an HBO show, they're but if just, it's the, but if it continues to be the best, it's not like. Um, what was the name of the, the Jamaican we were asking again. about snubs. I only say this because you were asking about right. who was snubbed. And it's hard for me to say because, like, for instance, okay, uh, Ted Lasso. Well, let's, let's, st let's stick Sigma with the drama, drama for the second year. I mean, I would say, you know, this drama category, like, I love Ozark. I love Ozark. Do I love Ozark more than I like Succession? Different kinds of shows. Yeah. It's hard. It, it would be hard to say. Um, Succession feels, however more universal more mm. biblical in a way where i mean but that's not true either because ozark i guess maybe because it just place, takes place in new york ozark's very biblical too in terms of retribution and justice served right. and you know it feels it feels like when you do bad things you're gonna suffer so it's it's hard man it's it but you I, know what? I, it's, it's hard again i was just gonna say like take let's let's transmute it to a different like subject matter but like usain bolt for a long time was the fastest man on the planet right you don't go at his Second Olympics say, well, we already know you're fast, so we're not going to give you the gold medal this year. Even if you run fastest, we're going to give it to this but the, other think, guy who runs uniquely. But I think the thing about running fast is it's a it's <laughs> it's a, the metric is speed. Oh, so you're saying there's objective stuff and subjective stuff? Yes. I will see. I agree with you on that. <laughs> uh, and and I think that objectively, if somebody runs faster, you get yes. It. Now the the thing about about TV is. Or, or anything when you're judging apples and oranges. Like, let's say if you had an Academy Award for fruit, you know, there's bananas, there's raspberries, <laughs> there's, and you're, it's all, it, and there's five fruits, and you have to vote which fruit is better. 
I mean, that would be completely to me subjective. But they do that, right? Like there, there are food competitions. There, oh, whether it's, and you're right. It's all. It's a matter of subjective taste. Wine. Yeah, wine. Judging that's a great wine. Ex- wine you know, internet, we were talking earlier about international beer competitions and all that kind of stuff. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a thousand percent subjective. That's why I put it to you again. As one subjective voter, if they said for whatever reason it couldn't be succession, take succession out of it, and you could vote for one of the others to win, which one would you, in your own subjective experience and whatever the show, oh, would you have voted for? I would probably vote for Squid Game just because... I'm surprised. I thought you'd say Ozark. Here's the thing about Ozark. Ozark follows a long tradition of crime thriller shows. Everything from The Godfather to, well, in a way, to Succession. You know, it's all about... Whereas I'd never really seen, you could say that Squid Game was kind of like Battle Royale, but it's really not because it's delving into societal inequality and people that don't have money and they're being preyed upon. There's things that are going on in Squid Game I've just never seen before. So from that alone, if Succession already has won, and it's still good, I'm like, I know it's good, but Squid Game, Squid Game showed me something I'd never seen before. Okay, so you would go Squid, Squid Game. I'd go Squid Game, but I do love... <laughs> I mean, listen, the, every single uh, I, I show know, on it's this tough, list. Man. It's, it's a hard, it was, it's hard. Dad, you were mentioning on the show earlier today that you just look at a list like this and you go, my God, television's really good right now. Because there's, there's, there's not one show on this list that I think, well, that doesn't belong here. Right. You know what no, I mean? Okay, I so, have you, though. What would you vote for? I, I, actually, oddly enough, I'd have a much easier time of it. Severance. I, I would. Severance, to me, is... First of all, I have never seen anything like it. You know like, what? With Squid Game, I enjoyed Squid Game very much. Deserves a place on this list. But like, I have seen things like Battle Royale and Hunger Games, and uh, James Gunn even produced one not long ago. Yeah. Uh, what was that one where it was in the, the office building? building? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I've seen, although the Squid Game is still very, very different, but Severance was so unique in its concept. See, I would go, I could go with you there. I, I mean, that, but again, that's not take anything away from Better Call Saul, Euphoria, Ozark. I mean, it's, by the way, Stranger Things just had their best season ever. Yeah. Right? And and it wasn't just fun little genre show. It it was like excellent television. But I think, I think really at the end of the day, I would have voted for Succession overall. But if you take Succession off it, my next one would have been Severance. Well, see, now you go back to, to which show like the end of succession season three oh so godfather was epic yeah, it was like, unbelievable like if you get to the end of that series you, you're going okay i mean i can't I when can't... her husband comes in acting all innocent and you knew and that's that... why he won best supporting actor oh yeah and all, all i could see in my head was michael corleone hugging fredo and saying i know it was you fredo I know is you and you broke my heart. That's all I could think was in my head. And when see, that I'll happened. violate my own logic, John, and go, I would probably voted for succession too, yeah. simply because <laughs> of the way it ends. It, it's just I don't know how that show consistently does. Again, I still think Yellowstone needed to be on this list, but but that's I, I would agree with you. Yeah. Or or even even 1883. You know, 1883 was pre- another one. But I, I, that's considered a limited series, I think. Oh, well, right, right. You're right. You're so right. that one's so, but listen, we could go on this all day because this category, <laughs> like you said, is so stacked. Let's go on to comedy though, because Comedy was really, really interesting. Now, I again, I think the one that won Ted Lasso is the one that I think fairly easily would have gotten my vote. Yeah. But Barry, Hacks, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Only Murders in the Building, which is, I thought was the one show that had a real shot at dethroning Ted Lasso. I, I have to say, you know, I watched Hacks with Elizabeth because wonderful. Gene Smart, again, incredible performance. Um, but o- only murders in the building. What I loved about that show is it was so unique, and there was something about it. Again, I'd never seen before the the ensemble cast, and not just Steve Martin and Martin Short and what's her face. You know, um, why am I drawing a blank on her name? Selena yeah. Gomez. Cool. Yes, Selena, yes, Gomez. Selena Gomez. She's sorry, Selena. She's I great in it, by the way. She's great. By the way, take a a younger actress and say we're gonna throw you in with two of the most celebrated figures in the medium. Good luck. And she does. Oh, she, no, she, she she stands shoulder to shoulder with him. She's she holds in her this. own. And again, you know, this is another show that I watched all of. And it's it's just a wonderfully entertaining show and different. But then again, so is Ted Lasso. Yeah. And the one other the one I didn't mention that's still on the list here is it's actually one of my absolute favorites, which is what we do in the shadows. A show that I thought was 
outrageous that they would even do this cheap knockoff version of the movie and it's i actually prefer it to the movie i actually you know, prefer the show to the movie this is going to seem silly to say this but again it's because i'm a snob like i love i love what we do in the shadows i love the movie but because it's horror and i can't believe i'm going to say this i feel that it's a little more lightweight mm. and it's it's easier to create comedy around monster figures because of the you have tropes you have built-in tropes right. that you can play against than it is to do something like only murders in the building it's like it's harder to establish those more realistic characters in a venue where you like them because we've got horrors but that's just again it's me being snobby so so let me put it to you uh, i'll answer this one first actually by the way in abbott elementary Okay, this is dude. one my wife has got me watching. This is going to be on this nominee list for the next Forever. five or six years. Forever. Yeah, it, it's going to be on this list for a while. I, I think my if it wasn't for Ted Lasso, and Ted Lasso is the one that would have got my vote, but if that was off the list, I think I'm probably going only murders in the building. What about you? I'm going to say yeah, because, I, again, I just enjoyed watching that show so much. You know, and it was, I loved all those characters, and I loved the relationships, but I will say this. I also really loved Hacks. You know, I liked that whole thing. But but again, Hacks seemed less universal and more personal, but it was still great, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's won a lot of awards the last... I, I, and G I love Gene Smart. I'll watch Gene Smart in anything. All right, guys. Well, listen. Uh, again, and there were, there were like 45 other categories we could be talking about here. We'll just focus on this. But I mean, I... People the, are laughing. The, I call myself a snob. I <laughs> I just I'm looking at this list, especially the drama list. You can make an argument for any one of these. Like, yeah. sir, if Euphoria won, who could really object? If Ozark had won, who can really object? If Squid Game had won, who can really object? I no. mean, I, I mean, all these are worthy, and and the the comedy category almost as much. Anyway, guys. Uh, that's it for we're gonna spend the rest of our time now just hearing <laughs> from you guys and what you guys want to talk about maybe you want to chime in on this little part but listen before we get into the live questions part we're going to take a second and hear from the sponsor of today's video our friends over oh wait a second hold a second hold a second never mind Text message came in that I thought looked really important. It's not. Anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, our friends over at Manscaped. We want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's video, Manscaped. Now, guys, you know I love Manscaped. You've heard me go on and on about the Lawnmower 4.0 and mm, that body wash. I love it so much. And so we got to ask, guys, have you started your spring cleaning yet? The carpets need cleaning, the drapes need dusting, and your lawn needs mowing, gentlemen. And you guys know Manscaped is more than just one product. They have a whole lineup of products to help you guys feeling, smelling, and looking your best. And so Manscaped is proud to present to you the Performance Package 4.0, which is the only tool that you need to keep your boys looking, smelling, and feeling good this spring. Now, to start off with, you get the Lawnmower 4.0. Guys, we have talked about this. What is wrong with us? Why have we for so long been using these terrible tools that were never meant for cutting our hair down there? The razor clipper things on our electric razors. That's barbaric, guys. You need the Lawnmower 4.0. And then there's the Weed Whacker. You guys have heard our own Ray Aura talk about this thing. He loves using it to get that hair in your nose and the ear hair hair and then they offer lots of other stuff like the crop preserver it's an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer the crop reviver it's a spray on toner for your balls and of course they've got the perfect grooming tool for your face with the plow 2.0 the perfect razor for the finest shave on that face so guys get 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code campia that's c-a-m-p-e-a -E at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off and free shipping with the promo code campia at manscaped.com it's time to throw out your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life and thank you to our friends at manscaped for sponsoring an episode here on the john campia channel all right guys with that down let's get over to your live questions that's what we're here for an open mic so uh rob what do we got what do we have james argenta is back and says the new joffrey i mentioned earlier is a key character with the name joffrey who is friends with lanor who will be in 
episode five and had a cameo in episode three. Oh, I had no idea. I didn't know that either. I just assumed when you said uh, the new Joffrey, I just thought you meant, oh, that's going to be Aegon. Yeah, Maybe yeah. Aegon the, is the new Joffrey. The boy I, king. I, I did not know. Thank you for clarifying that, man. I appreciate that very much. The All new right. Joffrey. What's next? Richard K says, what's the best Christian Slater movie? Ooh. Pump up the volume, baby. That's um, a pretty good one. What's the one where he's basically a creepy stalker of a girl and he watches her when she sleeps and it's it's considered a romance movie? Oh, I don't I, know. I mean, I like true romance. I'm going to say true romance is my but favorite, that's, that's not the one. But it's, no, it's the one. Guys, in the live chat, help me out. There's a Christian Slater movie where he's like basically creepily stalking this girl. Like, Is it Untamed Heart? You know what? I think it might be Untamed Heart. That might be it. <laughs> that like might it be, be it. Um, actually, what's the Star Trek movie he's in? Uh, he's in Star Trek Six. Yeah, that's right. He comes to, he's Sulu's uh, yeoman. Yeah. He comes and knocks on the door and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, it's His, it's his mom, Slater. Mary Jo Slater, was the casting director. Oh, that's, really? Yeah, she's a casting director. But you that's know what? I, I brought it up on the show before. One of my favorite Christian Slater things ever, besides the fact that he's on Archer, every, he's a recurring character on Archer, besides that, he had a show about eight years ago, I think it was called My Own Worst Enemy, where he played just an average guy, and then he'd have these blackouts. When he'd ever go to sleep, he'd wake up, and he was this super, super agent. Yeah. And then eventually, the, they, lear they learned about each other's existence, and they have to write notes to each other, like of this split personality of them. It only lasted one season and it got canceled, but I really liked it. He was, was also great in Heathers. Oh, that's right. As I forgot a villain. about him in that. That's right. Isn't he in like an MCU pro project coming up? Like, I could have swore I that saw him. That sounds yeah, right. Sounds I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. Right. All right. Anyway, what's next? Uh, Sam Fisher says, did you ever see the Game of Thrones bad lip reading video? No. It changes Game of Thrones into workplace comedy set at a medieval themed amusement park. It's hilarious. Say hey, what? I have not watched those in a couple of years. But there are a few things as funny on the internet as those bad lip reading videos. Yeah. Some of them are absolutely hilarious. So good. So good. I, I didn't even know they were still existed, <laughs> to be honest with you. But no. now hearing that, I'm going to want to go and check oh, that out. So good. Thanks for putting that on the radar. All right, what's next? Uh, so Richard K says, with Brendan Fraser kind of having a resurgence at the moment with Doom Patrol and Batgirl, even though it's canceled, he was still cast. And with all the Oscar buzz over the whale, could we get a Mummy 4? No, back. no, you're, ne you're never going to make an entire movie just because one of the actors in it is having a spurt. Because one of the things Hollywood knows is that spurts come and go real quick. Yes. And the reality is, even if they wanted to do a Mummy 4 right now, um, it would be three years till it would come out. Yeah. And who knows if Brendan Fraser is even a hot... So that's why you never greenlight a movie. Oh, hey, he's hot right now. Let's make a movie. Uh, so no, probably not. I don't think so either. All right, what's next? Uh, Richard K says, oh, that oh. is that was what I said. Uh, and uh, Casey Mack says, hey, just wondering, have you seen the trailer for the new Amazon trailer called The Peripheral starting Chloe Moretz? Yes. I, I just watched it this morning uh, for the first I, time. Yeah, it's based on the William Gibson novel. It looks pretty interesting. I, I, I thought it was a really good trailer, even though, and I forgive these for first trailers, even though I couldn't really make heads or tails out of what was really going on. But oh. I'm like, it feels pretty intense. Let me tell you, I read the book. And Did it's, you? it's a little tough. What's, to the base, what's the basic gist? There are two different timelines okay. and there is stuff going on. And how do I put this? You can, you can, you can access timelines through virtual reality, sort of. And there are, there's a lot of espionage and a lot of intrigue going on in multiple timelines at the same time. You know what that sounds a little bit like? There was that J.K. Simmons show that was on recently. Counterpoint. Counterpoint, where there was this door between two different alternate Yeah, instead of alternate universes, it's two different timelines. But you know what? It does have kind of an element like that, mm. but it's it's in the future. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I just really like Chloe Grace Moretz. I'm, I'm actually liking she, her more and more. She yeah, gets older. She's all, I, I love her. She's All awesome. Right. Yeah, What's you next? know, I saw him at D23. It's because he's going to be in Willow and the Spiderwick Chronicles, Christian Slater. So those okay, two, that's those why. Two that's why. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. Ben Rayner says, if they were to oh, make... Oh, by the way, Ben sent like a $20 super chat. Thank you, Ben. Uh, by the way, 1999 is his super chat. Today is September 13th. And if you were a fan of Space 1999... That's the day the moon... Today is the day the moon was blown out of Earth's orbit. Uh, this is still one of my favorite ships in all of sci-fi. It's Eagle Transporters. Yep. So good. Wait, I didn't read Ben's super chat. <laughs> if they were to make the show Harley Quinn crossover with anyone, could you see the Doom Patrol showing up in animated form? I could see those two crew working well together. Robot Man with King Shark or Clayface. 
Would you like it? No. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because the whole gist of Harley Quinn, the animated show, is other than Harley, who is kind of like that in every iteration, the thing about Harley Quinn is it completely takes a character and completely re-envisions them. Right. A hundred percent. King Shark is not the King Shark from all the other iterations. Clayface, Lady Gaga is not the <laughs> same Clayface from the other iterations. Right. At all. Yeah. So it's it's like, well, what would Doom Patrol be in there? Well, you're now you're kind of envisioning Doom Patrol the way you currently envision them from the Doom Patrol show. And that's not really what the Harley Quinn show does. Right. So for that reason, I would say no. I don't think I could see Doom Patrol. That's there. sound reasoning. I, I'll buy that. Yeah. yeah I'll buy that. Now. But I do love Doom Patrol. All right. What's next? Uh, Talking Entertainment with Josie says, by any chance, did you get your maybe, just maybe, from the Kelly scene in Clerks 2? Also, Rosario Dawson is adorable. Uh, Rosario Dawson is the best in that movie. Like, absolutely the best in that movie. Uh, no, I actually didn't. I, I, I mean, maybe, just maybe. I mean, that's that's a long existing right. phrase. I mean, so it didn't come from that. I just started saying it, and it just kind of became a thing. Good question, though. All right, what's next? Uh, uh, Josh Kahn says, even though to me Ted Lasso season two and Succession season three were a step down in quality, I can't complain about them winning. My choices would be Severance and Only Murders. Better Call Saul fans seem a bit mad. Well, look, I, every year, fans of X show will be upset when their show doesn't win. And that's understandable. That's part of being a fan, right? It's same as in sports. It's, it's part of the game. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I did think Ted Lasso, the last season was a slight step down from its previous season. I still thought it was, even though it was a step down, it was still a shoulder above yeah. everybody else. I did not agree the succession took a step down. I I, I thought succession stepped up more. But that, I, that's I, I didn't take. think it stepped down either. Yeah, but I, it is funny that you probably, I think you sent in that super chat before you even started the show, and those are the exact same alternate picks I had, yeah. severance and only murders. So that's great minds, my friend, great minds. All right, what's next? <laughs> Terry McGinnis from Batman Beyond says, wondering what your thoughts are on Sabra, the Israeli Mossad superhero, being in Captain America 4. What's her history? Is she a mutant? I don't know much about Sabra. By the way, I don't, and I, and I say this honestly, I don't know if that's accurate. I've seen some headlines saying that, but I, I haven't had a chance to actually read into it to see, yeah. wait, is this one of the Gus's Gas Station Reviews dot fart thing that, that came out there? Or like Henry Cavill is Hyperion? Or is that actually something that was actually in Yeah, I don't know. I, I, and I say, I don't know. It very well could be. Um, if it's true then it seems like a Captain America with a Sam Wilson Captain America with his military and all that kind of stuff, that would seem like a logical place to bring them in. As far as the character themselves go, I have to, I don't know a lot about the character. So I, I don't know if you've got much. No, I, I really don't. And it is called New World Order. So yeah. it makes sense that we would see superheroes from around the world. I mean, I like that idea. Whenever I read Sabra, though, all I can think about is The Office when Saber took over Dunder Mifflin and they thought it was pronounced Sabre. <laughs> That's all I can think about. All right, what's next? Uh, Gabriel Barker or uh, Gabriel Baker says Marvel should have skipped Comic Con this year and announced everything at D23. Avengers, Daredevil, Thunderbolts, Leader, and Cap Four. They screwed up. They screwed up, but I don't think they screwed up by going to Comic Con. Comic Con is still Comic Con. Right. And I, I think Marvel absolutely should be there. And while I never thought they would, like, I didn't think they would rock the world at Comic-Con. And they didn't rock the world. But I, th but I thought the reason they weren't going to rock the world at Comic-Con was because they were going to save a lot of her D23. Turns out they really weren't saving a lot. But still, Marvel should absolutely be at Comic-Con. I, 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 just, I just think that's kind of like having football on Thanksgiving. It just needs to be there. DC should be there. Marvel should be there. It is the annual event, and I think they should absolutely maintain a presence there. I'm and, right and, there with and, you. And it's their way, too, of establishing their dominance, too, just reminding the world, hey, everybody, we're still Marvel. You be at that huge event, and we're still the, the headliner. I think you maintain that position. I agree. All right, what's next? What's next is Orange Hand says, my ideal X-Men casting which I know you or Rob wouldn't object to, is Lily James' rogue wearing the classic green and yellow outfit. 
Lily James in X-Men is a great idea. She's a great actress. She's fantastic. I don't know that I see her as Rogue. I don't either. I don't know that that's a good She could fit. be the White Queen. She, I mean, look, there's a Emma lot Frost. of... She could be uh, a Kitty Pride. She could be... I mean, there's a lot of different characters she could be, but, but I, I don't see her as a Rogue. I see Rogue and Kitty Pride as being younger. You know, whereas, whereas... Yeah, but even if you wanted to have a little bit of an aged up thing, yeah, I, I still just don't think that's... She's a terrific actress. Everybody knows I love Lily James. I just don't know that that's the right character. For I don't. Her. I don't. I don't know either. To be honest, I wouldn't. I wouldn't throw it out. I mean, but... you know, she's also very unique looking. Like, I would love to see her play like Lalandra, the leader of the Shi'ar Empire. I mean, that would work. Uh, and they could interview. They could introduce the Shi'ar Empire in the MCU before they introduce the X Men. They. I mean, they could. They've done wilder things than the Shi'ar. So yeah, like I. I man, look. I'll watch Lily James in anything. Yep, I agree. And that, All right, what's and next? that Emmy dress she was in, I'd love to watch her more than that. Oh, jeez. One oh, Jonathan Voiko sends in a dollar super chat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Our producer only gives us a buck. That's all we're worth to you, John. I had, hey, I had to test. People said the super chats weren't working. As soon as I sent the dollar in, they suddenly worked. <laughs> suddenly it works. I think you should test it again. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's next? Make sure, that $20 go Make sure those $100 ones are working. Yeah. yeah. 156 Impulse says, hi, guys, big fan. I'm a Daredevil fan. I love Daredevil. I want Elektra on the new show. I love the Daredevil romance. It depends on what way they decide to go. Like, a lot of people love the Karen romance. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I mean, the Elektra stuff is great, but listen, we don't, even if they do bring in Elektra, I don't don't know that it's going to be the same Electra that you had in the Netflix series. No. So if you're really holding out hope for that Electra, I don't know that that's the Electra we're going to get. I think it's going to be a completely different Electra. I think it's going to be, but I know one thing, John, if we're going to get Electra, you know what else we're getting? The hand? Ninjas, that's yeah. right. We're getting ninjas. <laughs> and you know what I say, there's nothing that can't be made better without the proper application of ninjas. I. Uh, it's hard, it's science. It is science. It's just science. It's an objective truth. It is science. <laughs> All right, what's next? Dwan Williams says, uh, one of three. Uh, wait, oh, the ralicent relationship heightened the Shakespearean tragedy of fire and blood. While other changes stemmed from the necessity of the medium, uh, meanwhile, action Galadriel Harfoot in the Second Age, Bronwyn uh, Adiron romance is a rewrite of the death of Finrod or the rewrite of the exile of Noldor, all weakened or even contradict the theme of the Silmarillion. Not that's not true at all. That's that's not true at all. Anyway, but go ahead. Keep um, going. That doesn't mean Rings of Power will be bad, but it does mean that is angering uh, people who fell in love with the books first and are very protective of it. Um, again, I, I I count that as absolute nonsense. The Peter Jackson, these same people will claim to have a deep love of the Peter Jackson renditions. The Peter Jackson films so radically changed a lot mm -hmm. like everything right down to the core personality of your main character bilbo baggins or, or frodo i should say frodo's personality is completely if you know the books and you read the books frodo's personality is completely different in the books than it is in um in in jackson's movies and, and then a whole lot of other stuff as well this whole note people all of a sudden being very precious see what i did there mm -hmm. being very very precious about by the way <laughs> A lot of these things aren't even narratively written out in the Tolkien writings. A lot of these things are like a part of appendices and just whatever, i.e. things that aren't very important. Like I, I cannot help but laugh at people who make a big deal. And I've seen some people making big deals over the fact that the dwarf women don't have beards. It was mildly mentioned in the writings a couple of times in passing, then completely ignored and never made out to be anything important. So the dwarf women don't have beards. It's okay. And we go back to the Peter Jackson movies, entire characters were removed and then replaced with other characters. Well, like Erwin was like completely doing the things that her character does not do in the books and stuff like that. Oh, right? and, and, and she didn't even rescue Frodo. No, she didn't. That was, did. yeah, and was... so, I mean, I, I get it. This whole idea about you didn't do it the exact way it was done in the book. That is such a nonsense thing. Okay, that's fine. But it, look, watch the show. And if to you the show is not good quality, then the show is not good quality. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly fine. But to enter into watching the show and bringing all this baggage with you along saying, you've got to do this, 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 and this. And even if the show is great, you're going to go, I dismiss the show because it didn't do these other things. 
I, if that was true, we would never be able to enjoy any comic book movie. We'd never be able to enjoy the Peter Jackson films. We'd never be able to enjoy any of that stuff. I just think it's a weird way to approach fandom. Well, look at Game of Thrones. And if you went by the books, Tyrion Lannister had his nose cut off. You know, he was disfigured. Now, would you want to watch eight seasons of a movie where Peter Dinklage had either a prosthetic cut off nose or they green screened it so you'd see right into his skull? I mean, it wouldn't be fun to watch. And I think when you think about how to, it, it's all about adaptation. And when you're adapting one thing into another medium, I'm, I think that did they capture the spirit of what the original book was? Because some great adaptations are very, very different, but they captured the feel of what the book is supposed to be. And that's what I always ask myself. when I, If I've read a book, I'm like, did this capture the spirit of the book that I read or is it not not that there might i saw somebody sent me a meme today i forget the name of of the elf character that's in love with the human woman oh right i forget the character's name but somebody wrote something about that thing is like does does this does this show feel like tolkien does this show feel like it and the guy wrote you know this is that scene where he's having to chop down the tree he said dude there's a scene where an elf is weeping because he has to cut down a tree there is nothing more tolkien than that i just thought that was i i'm, I'm not i'm not using that as a point i'm just saying i thought it was a funny meme I that is thought, funny i thought it was a funny meme all right what's next uh dwan williams says i think the big reason why the george R. R. martin fan base are a lot more receptive of the changes is because the changes elevate the original theme of fire and blood I, well, that's what I mean. I mean, but that's a subjective thing. That's sure. a subjective thing. Like whether so now you're saying it's okay to change it if, in your opinion, the change worked. But that and that ultimately that should be the same principle you apply to all of it. If the change doesn't work for you, then yeah, then then it didn't work, and that's the bottom line. But don't like or dislike something because they did change at all, or because they didn't change at all. You're absolutely right. If you feel that the change elevated it, then you forgive it because what, Rob? Winning cures everything, well, and that should be the the standard. Well, also, you know, when you're when you're making a move, when you're making a movie or a television show, we living in the real world understand how people relate to one another. Books are uh, are flights of imagination, and yes, authors try and make those things very rich, but in the real world, you know, it's not the same. And when you're watching actual human beings in a, in front of a camera. They act differently. They look differently. They say different things. I mean, John, can you imagine if Return of the King ended with Scouring the Shire? After three movies, they go back. And and the whole... If, do, 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 I mean, do, do, Tolkien's do. point is is run home <laughs> by the Scouring of the Shire. I mean, that, that was his great fear, is that the modern age would do that to the Shire, no matter... Hey, we, we might win World War I, and all we're great conquering heroes, but if I get back home to England... That's been bombed to shit. And the Shire's there, and, and Saruman is running the place with Wormtongue, and the, basically the, the hobbits are enslaved. That was the end of his book. Would that have worked in a movie? I mean, it could have, but the audience would have revolted and said, this is the most horrible. I sat here for 12 hours for this. Yeah. Now, look, and remember, I, I say all this as somebody who I write, as of right now, I firmly believe House of the Dragon is the better show but yeah. over, oh, yeah. over Rings of Power. But my issues with Rings of Power have nothing to do with something as arbitrary as, well, they didn't follow this detail of the book. To me, it's issues of pacing. It's the issues of how they're laying out the structure of the narrative right now. I think it's picking up. I think it's picking up. But... That's why I, I think that House of the Dragon is clearly the better show right now. But so I, I say all this stuff as somebody who thinks House of the Dragon is the better show. Uh, and, but I also think too, like the character of, of Galadriel, for instance, mm. has been altered and turned into more of a generic. I mean, I understand the warrior. I don't mind. I love strong women characters, you know, Ripley, Buffy, Sarah Connor, great characters, but, but, they've turned things around to make them fairly generic fantasy tropes more than anything else. And I think, is that the, was this the best way to get into that story? That's what See, I- I disagree with you about, about that with Galadriel because I'm actually fascinated with the Galadriel character because I think they have made her in many ways. We gotta remember, we, we have a thousand years of evolution sure. to, between now and when we see her in the Peter Jackson films. But I really like the fact that she is such a flawed character right now. She right. is she is singularly focused, and I don't mean that in a good way. She is obsessed with her goals so much that she loses sight of the people that her obsession affects. She has outright been willing to sacrifice her own people. She has no social skills. 
Yeah, yeah. No social skills and has to constantly be saved from social things, whether it's by Elrond or by now her uh, her human uh, buddy who turns out he's royalty. It's kind of like Lone Star. When he says, do you see the thing that reminded me of Lone Star in, in Space right. Bubble? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says I'm a prince. Um, I, I find that I find that to be very not generic that we find in a lot of our here, particularly our female heroes. We don't normally see that level of, of faults and failures in them. And I'm kind of fascinated by it. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good point. I just think that, do we ever think that that Galadriel character is going to fall in battle and lose? We know she's not. Well, we know she can't. And yeah. And I, and that's why I think that one of the things about Lord of the Rings that was so interesting is that these most unassuming of people, are the, are the people that have the power to save all of mankind or all of Middle Earth in the palm right. of their hands, and they don't know it. I, I just, I like that reluctant hero trope. I mean, if you're and in fantasy, so much that the whole, even in Star Wars, it all comes back down to the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell and all that. I mean, she's already kind of a badass. I don't believe that Galadriel's in that much peril. Well, I mean, at the end of the day. But if you look at Jackson's films, you have a wide variety of characters. Like, I never, uh, with the Balrog scene as an exception, I never thought for a second Gandalf was going to fall in battle or that Aragorn. No. But we had those characters, and then we had Merry and Pip, and we had Frodo and Sam. And I think in this one, we have like, yeah, we have our Galadriel, but we have our dwarves, and we have our our Harfoots, and we have our whatever. So, And, and we have the, the human villagers who are in a, the humanities in a very different state right now than yep. they are a thousand years later. So they, they kind of mix it up a little bit. No, but they do. And I am I am most curious about episode four because for me, like I said, episode one, I just didn't think was good. Episode two showed a lot more promise. Episode three, to me, the one that is starting to look like it can fulfill yeah. what it could be. Now, to me, episode four becomes the most important episode because does it build on that momentum that I think episode three gave? Does it continue that? Or was episode three a fluke and it drops right back down to that? And, and that's why, to me, right now, episode four is the most important episode they've had so far. And, and episode four, it's very interesting because episode four, Rings of Power, is the halfway point. Episode yeah. five in Game of Thrones is their halfway, is their, point. Their halfway point. And we know that all hell's going to break loose in house of the dragon yes so the world is going to change <laughs> whereas anyway, we, we probably spent yeah, way too much time on, on that let's let's move on what's next Suthius says why exactly is val on the thunderbolts team is the d23 lineup a misdirect i thought that she's in a leadership position and not an actual member well, she could be tomato tomato yeah i mean maybe I mean, she is clearly, clearly from what we saw in the previous projects she is a fundamental figure in this like whether she's it's like asking why is nick fury in an avengers movie uh, i mean so it's it's I, I think yes yeah, her role in this thing is going to be made very clear and i don't know if marvel's going to mix it up and actually give her powers or something like that that we haven't seen or haven't known yet maybe but even if they don't just her as a the woman behind the curtain yeah kind of role could be awesome for her to play so awesome yeah so we'll see i'm looking forward to it all right what's next have Tim we Platt. done this uh part two of two yet or not uh, yet. I haven't you seen haven't seen part one. one? All right, I think I have it here. Oh, there it okay. is. Okay. Uh, on Sunday, I went to the Commander's Jags game. At the stadium, they were selling mugs with the team logo imposed over an outline of not Washington, D.C., but Washington State. <laughs> hmm. I swear, if this franchise were a movie, it would be The Room. I, I don't know how <laughs> Zack Snyder, Dan Snyder, I don't know how Zack Snyder, owner of the Washington Football Club. Um, I don't know how Dan Snyder is still in the league. I, I really don't. Have you ever, like even seen some of the stuff about like stuff that happens at the stadium, <laughs> where like literal shit was pouring out of piping onto the crowd, and like I, the, when you look at the overall mismanagement of that entire, and they've got a great coach right now. They've got a fabulous coach, and. I just don't know how Dan Snyder's still in the league. I just, I just don't get it. Anyway, sorry that that's sports talk. I really up. want one. If they, if you can go get me a cup, you know, for the Washington D.C. team <laughs> that has Washington State on it, I would love to own that's, one. Being that I am from Washington gap. State. All right, what's next? <laughs> um, Matthew Medina says one of two. Euphoria wins. Actress in a drama series, guest actor, choreography, cinematography, makeup, and editing. Should have won. Uh, Should have won score. The music is. And I have it right here. All original by Labyrinth. 
Season two, episode five was one of the greatest TV acting performances I've ever seen by Zendaya. I've been on the receiving end of those uh, of those insane breakdowns when an addict loses all hope. Well, I mean, listen, there's again, there's a reason why Zendaya's won best actress twice now, youngest actress ever to do it. Youngest actress ever to win it once, youngest actress ever to win it twice, first black actress to win best uh, lead actress twice. And listen, that is a type of role. We often talk about sometimes you get these great actors in roles, but the role like never really demanded a lot from them or, or called for a lot from them. Listen, I haven't watched all of Euphoria, but this is clearly a role that is asking the performers to push themselves yes. to limits that we don't often see actors doing. And that can create for some very powerful television. So powerful, I have a very difficult time watching it because it's it's... It has an impact on me, but it's not a. It's, it's just making this the show is so effective. It just makes me feel awful. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, all right. Great, great point, man. Well said. All right, what's next? Uh, Suthia says, "Do we know if another? Uh, I guess do we know if another alien movie or show is moving forward? One that will finally kill off David. Great character, but that psycho android needs to go. Well, Noah Hawley's doing his alien series for TV. I think for Hulu that's set on Earth. Yep." I, I've not heard a lot. I haven't heard a lot about it. So yeah. I don't, is it happening? I think it is. Is this, I mean, is it, is it in production? It, is it still being written? Is it still, I, I honestly <laughs> I, don't know. I feel like that's like the Shogun series. Like they're saying Shogun's going to debut. I'm like, you've been shooting for how long? Yeah, but they, at least we know they've been shooting that. Right? <laughs> right. I'm so excited about Shogun. I am too, but man. And again, it was a lot like, it's like the, um, acolyte thing it was announced over two years ago yeah. at that investors days call so i mean yeah we'll see all right what's next uh john redcorn says where's the craven trailer movie opens in january well, i here's the thing though i i understand the question but we are living in a very different world marketing wise than we were three or four years ago it used to be and i know a lot of people are still used to this that sometimes movies would literally drop their first trailers like a year before the movie would come out. And we realized that that was wasted money. It That didn't actually accomplish anything. And it is now, whereas three or four years ago, it would be very, very unusual. Today, it's not that unusual that about three months for, for some movies can be when the first trailer drops. And we've seen it done to some pretty good effect. You know, ba basically save save your marketing budget for that last home stretch and then really go hard and get the results. So if we get into November and we haven't seen a Craven trailer yet, I'll say I'll bet that movie's getting delayed. But right now I'm not worried about it. Yeah, also there's nothing in theaters. You know, there's kind of a lull in the excitement about movies anyway. And you you wait got, till Black Panther comes out. Yeah, that's what I mean. Black Panther, Avatar, there's stuff coming out later. And I think that Look, three months, it's still October, November, December, and then you've got the whole holiday season. People are home after school yeah. and they're home for the holidays. So if trailers are out in November, December, you get that much more eyes on them. And by the way, they did show us a little bit of Craven footage when we were at CinemaCon. Yeah. So it's there. I just think they're probably holding back. But again, if we get to November and it's not there, I'm going to think it's getting pushed. But we've still got time between now and November. I'm, I'm not worried about it right now. All right, what's next? Mark Nadal says, hi, guys. Just wondering, John, if you had been keeping up with the happenings in the UK, a real life Game of Thrones as a Canadian, I'm truly fascinated. I have no idea what you're talking I about. I think talking about the succession. Is somebody challenging Charles? <laughs> Charles. Is William, is William like. King Charles III, is it? Is, is William coming to the to Buckingham with a sword in hand to challenge for the throne? Uh, no, but, I... <laughs> but, you know, Harry went, I don't know. Which is the older one? Uh, yeah, William's William. the older one. William's the heir to the throne now, right? I, I'll, I'll listen. I thought for about 10 years, I really thought that Charles, and I, I still kind of think this, Charles is 73 years old, I believe. He has been waiting. He's been groomed for the throne that he thought probably thought he was going to have 20 years ago. I think he's going to sit on the throne for a bit. I, But I do also think he knows that his son is far more popular with the people than he is. He's, his son is Diana's son. I think, and I don't base this on anything, I think he's going to hold the throne for a year, 
And then I think he's going to pull what his great, great grandfather, uh, great, great, great uncle did abdicate as, and I think his great, I think he's going to abdicate the throne after about a year. He's been waiting his whole life to be King. So I think he's going to be King for a bit. Then I think he's going to, out of a sense of duty, which is something that his mother instilled, I think in him out of a sense of duty for the good of the country, he will abdicate the throne. I think William will take over the throne. Uh, but I mean, other than that, I don't know what drama we're talking about. Yeah. I'm not sure either. I, all right, Other what's all next? This stuff, the succession issue. Uh, Dwan Williams says, one or two, in case you were curious, the Brackens and the Blackwoods have been sh uh, shanking each other since before there were Brackens and Blackwoods. Oh, you, yeah, with the kid uh, stabbing that yeah. dude? Yeah, yeah, their they, family history actually goes goes back a ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They once fought a century-long war because a Bracken woman remarked that a Blackwood that Blackwood women have no tits. The Blackwoods <laughs> won that, that very bloody war. <laughs> I just thought when that kid pulled the sword and I thought, well, that's not going to well, but then all of a sudden the camera cuts back to them and this kid is running that dude through. I'm like, good on you, kid. Shut that bastard's mouth up. Oh, yeah. You go, kid. I, I thought that was a pretty good scene. All right, what's next? Uh, Richard K says, my dream fantastic forecasting is Timothy Oliphant as Mr. Fantastic, Kira Knightley as Sue Storm, John Cena as Ben Grimm, The <laughs> Thing, and Ryan Gosling as Johnny Storm. Rufus Sewell will be Dr. Doom. Your thoughts? Uh, I don't do X actor and X role stuff. Like all I ever care about is, are you proposing talented actors? Because that's all that matters. And I, those all sound like, I would tell you what though, the one name you brought up is very interesting to me is Rufus Sewell. Now, a lot of people maybe don't know that name, but you've seen him. Oh yeah. Rufus Sewell is a fabulous actor. And Dark City, he was in. Yeah, Dark City. Of course, a lot of people will know him from A Knight's Tale yep. or whatever, but he is a terrific actor who doesn't get like the big juicy roles. And I think were you to give him a role like a Doctor Doom, I think he would do great with it. But I think there's probably 20 or 30 actors who would do great with it as well. I do like Timothy Oliphant as Reed Richards. I like him as anything. Yeah. Timothy Oliphant, he's just great. He's great. All right, what's great. next? Uh, Dwan Williams says, also, Rob, the book is Fire and Blood, not Blood and Fire. Sorry. Yeah, Rob. <laughs> I, 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 blood, I, I, I know. Fire and blood. All right. What's um, next? El Leonardo says, when it comes to movies such as Interstellar, Blade Runner, 2049, Hero, or Dune, we tend to say they look amazing. How much credit goes to the director versus a cinematographer or an editor? David Ayer didn't even edit his film. Well, look, it's a very collaborative effort. And obviously, a director works hand in hand with a cinematographer. Um, you know, a director explains what his shots, what he wants to get, and then the cinematographer executes on those shots. I have been on sets where there are there is a little bit of a battle between the director and the cinematographer. The cinematographer sometimes, depending on who they are, if they don't have a long standing relationship with the director, a lot of the time the cinematographer will try and and get the shots that they want. There's a little tension there, but for the most part. You know, all of these, these these are very collaborative jobs. The director, the editor, and the cinematographer are usually working in some kind of tandem together. But remember, you know, when a film is being shot, the director and the cinematographer are working to shoot the movie, and an editor very often is working on making an assembly of the movie while they're shooting. So sometimes a director doesn't even start working with an editor until after principal photography is over. Now, they'll go in and watch and all that, but they're not going to sit down because they don't have time. And the way studio movies are made, when a movie is done shooting, there's an assembly cut of what the editor has put together. And then the director and the editor will really sit down together and start working. It, it basically comes down to this, is that they do their work, but at the end of the day, everything has to be approved by the director. Yes. I remember my first experience directing. It was when I did my movie, The Anniversary. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But I hired people who did. Yes. So I remember I was really, really lucky. I found this really great guy as my cinematographer. I found a really great uh, a sound team, uh, two guys who were doing sound. I found a great lighting person. I found a great, like all these things. And I just, I hired great people because I just wanted them to do their thing, right? But these people were experienced. So like every lighting decision this guy wanted to do, it was like, okay, uh, they would come get me, director. Like, this, 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 this is, this is good. Sure. 
Okay, great. Cinematographer. Okay, this is what I'm thinking. We're going to do the shot here. Is this what you want or do you want this, this, and this? And I, I started realizing about how all that, it really comes down to the director who's going to make a thousand decisions. I remember one night, we were at a Designing Hollywood event and you were doing some interviews and you had James Gunn's Suicide Squad costume designer. And she was talking about how, yeah, she, clearly James Gunn doesn't know the first thing about costume design. Right. But she would have to have James come down and James would have to tell her his vision. She would bring it to life. And then he would come down again and, and she would show him everything that she's doing. And he would say, yes, yes, no, no, yes, 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 no, whatever. And whatever. So yeah, she's doing the designing. But like you were saying, it's very, very collaborative. Well, no. And also when you're talking about a director, let's say you're shooting a, a conversation like somebody shooting the two of us talking right now. We are in a movie. The director, the cinematographer would light the room the way there's purple light on the wall and everything. But you as the director would then say, okay, I would like to shoot it with there'd be a two shot of the two of us like we're looking at it now. There'd be close-ups, there'd be mediums and 50-50s. That's what you would do. The the cinematographer would have to make that look good. Yes. Yeah. You know, but but you would be calling those shots because each one of those shots is telling the story that you want to tell. So it's it is a very collaborative uh for and I think that look, a great director likes to work with great cinematographers. You yeah, know, and that's it, why you see a lot of the great directors will often work with the same cinematographer. Absolutely. Like Spielberg's yeah. work with, with the same cinematographer since Schindler's List and what, Jurassic Park? 93? <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. All right. What's next? Uh, Gabriel Baker says over or under 50%, the first Ant Man teaser drops with Black Panther. Under, with very, very, very few exceptions anymore, trailers don't drop with movies anymore. Trailers always, uh, always, 95% of the time, drop online somewhere around the time when a certain movie's coming out, but it is very, very rare anymore, exceedingly rare that a trailer drops with a movie. So I, I'll, I'll go under 50%. I will Are, too. Somewhere within the month, maybe. When does Quantum Mania even open? I can't even remember off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't know either. Can't remember. All right, what's next? Um, Johan, Johan Hauf says... Happy Breakaway Day this September 13th for Space 1999 ah. fans, including Rob. 23 years to the day since the moon broke away from Earth orbit. It's true. I mean, I look up in the sky and I realize I, I remember that tragic day when the <laughs> Earth was flooded, when the oceans, because of the losing of the moon. Yep. It was a terrible day, John. Terrible day. A lot of people lost their lives. For those of you who don't know, the basic gist of Space 1999, um, basically there is a base on the moon. I can't remember exactly what happened to cause it. Well, it was Moonbase Alpha, and they stored nuclear waste right. on the far okay. side of the moon. And uh, that nuclear waste dump malfunctioned. And it blew the moon off out of orbit and just off into space. Now this moon base just lives on this moon that is just hurling through space. And it's it's that's the basic idea of it. Yep. With a great ship design. Great ship Still design. Still my favorite one. All right, what's next? Um, Bert, and thanks for that, Johan. Bert says, Jennifer Coolidge, a.k.a. Stifler's mom, the OG MILF, still winning in life 20 years after being immortalized by John Cho's MILF guy number two in American Pie. Uh, did you see her acceptance speech? <laughs> no, I did like, they not. like played I did her not. off and she started dancing. It was hilarious. She couldn't get her speech out. I mean, it was she's hilarious. Good to see. All right, what's and next? She won an Emmy. Uh, Tim Platt says, what comic story that you think would make a good audiobook? For example, I just finished C uh, Civil War and Secret Wars. I guess that would make good Well, listen, audiobooks. if it's written out, if it's adapted and written out properly, any of them, then yeah, they I mean, would all make great audio. The Sandman audiobooks are amazing, and they're like 13 you know, hours long. It's amazing. Yeah, so, I mean, literally, I mean, maybe there's a couple of that are just very, 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 very action-heavy and centric. Wouldn't work so well. Like, you know, my favorite... My favorite comic book story of all time is Age of Apocalypse. Right. Um, that would make a great audio book. I, would it? I, I think it's, it's, it is I've a got the, visual one. Uh, it, but I got the omnibus, you know, if you went yeah. the huge thing. I think you could do it pretty cool. You could make it it take it probably 25 hours long. But it What would was be, the name of the series with Legion that led into Age of Apocalypse? It, it was focused... It was focused on because what causes, for those of you who don't know, the, what causes the events. X, there's X-Men Omega and X-Men, but that, and that led in, but I don't remember the actual Legion. Because what caused the events of Age of Apocalypse is that Charles Xavier's son, Legion, he decides, you know what? I want to do right by my dad. And man, my dad's had a hard life all because of that Magneto. I know. 
I will go back in time <laughs> and I will kill Magneto so my dad's life will be easier. Unfortunately, Charles Xavier sacrificed himself to save his friend Eric, and now time becomes rewritten. And now in the present, we live in a dystopian, almost apocalyptic kind of world where Charles Xavier died 20 years ago mm -hmm. and motivated by the sacrifice of his friend, Eric Magneto is inspired to save humanity and save save the world and he's inspired to form a team of super being mutants who will, he will name after his dead friend and call them the X-Men and they are standing against Apocalypse who rules North America, right? Is yeah, he, I yeah. can't remember, does he rule North America or Europe? I think it's North America. I think you're right, I think it's North America whereas humanity is off in Europe and certain mutants who are heroes in our regular timeline are now villains and yeah. certain some who are villains are now heroes Sabretooth is actually one of the i don't think Sabretooth is a particularly interesting combat character in age of apocalypse he's fascinating yeah so is juggernaut yeah in that one as well now it makes me want to go the, that every i look at that omnibus and you can work out with it it is my favorite comic books you're right because it spanned it's, every title yeah it's huge yeah it's oh. gigantic all right what's next dwan williams says sadly as much as i'd like my bank account forbids me from going into too much details about what is the theme of the Silmarillion or how these changes contradict that theme. So you'll have to trust me that the changes are serious. It's it's not serious. That's the thing. It it it's, it just reminds me a lot about beards on dwarf women. It's really not that serious. And besides that, what is the, I go back to what I tell comic book uh, movie fans all the time. The comics are the comics, the movies are the movies. And one, that is not, the fact that Civil War or Age of Ultron or whatever does things radically different than, than the comic book does, that is not disrespectful to the comic book. It's just a recognition that this is a different medium and we're telling a story here based on that, but we're going to adapt it. And I think you just got to approach it the same way with with uh, anything Tolkien-wise, just like Peter Jackson did. Well, so, it's interesting. When you think about Civil War, in the comics, the new warriors are like reality star superheroes, and they're going <laughs> after a supervillain team, and a school bus is blown up by a, by, a, by a school, and kids die. And that's what precipitates the whole registration act yeah. it has it's way different it's way different but the point is you get down to the conflict between steve and 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 tony and that conflict and who who's on those battle lines is really the heart and spirit of that story and i think that what you're dealing with with the rise of sauron you're, you're telling a story about how does this group of how do the, this disparate group of men of elves of dwarves team up to fight the first war of the ring and when you when it comes right down to it that's the story that you're telling. All the details, that's yeah, adaptation. I agree. I agree. All right, what's next? So, John Redcorn says, Roman Reigns <laughs> says, opened up on a potential career in Hollywood like The Rock. Do you think he has the potential to follow in his cousin's footsteps? No. No, I don't. I mean, but hey, listen. I didn't think John Cena did either. Until I saw him in Trainwreck. Trainwreck. How and funny I, was he in that? He was so funny, and I realized he found. Look, I, I also watched him in that one. The, the no, was it called the Marine? Uh, like, yeah, I think it was the yeah, Marine. something like that. And I remember thinking, huh, he's really terrible. But then he found that he has some really great natural comedic timing, and when he leans into that, he can be very effective. And you know, I talk about this about Dave Bautista. When he was just getting started in acting, he got into the hands of a director like James Gunn, who knew how to don't put this actor into a position where their weaknesses get exposed as a performer. Keep them in scenes that highlights their strengths. And Dave Bautista, all of a sudden, he looked amazing as Dax, Drax the Destroyer because he was in the hands of a director who knew how to shield their weaknesses, highlight their strengths. I don't think it's coincidence that you take that same director and now put a John Cena in his hands. And he's like, you know what? I'm not going to ask John Cena to do anything that's going to call for Shakespearean level acting. I'm going to play to his strengths. And we're going to put him in situations that let him highlight his strengths. And Peacemaker was straight up one of the best shows the last couple of years yep. as a result of that. So yep. could a director find 
whatever those strengths might be in a Roman Reigns, I don't know. Like, listen, he was in Hobbs and Shaw, and I think he grunted one or two lines. So I, I, I really have no idea if he has any actual acting ability or not. He's clearly got a great look. Right. And he's got a good following. But, I mean, uh, look what Hulk Hogan couldn't put together a movie career. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. All right, what's next? Good question, though. Ryan Ramirez says, love the show, John. This year's Emmys were loaded. It it, it was absolutely totally loaded. loaded. Yeah, totally. I mean, I didn't even, I didn't watch the show. Just reading through all the nominees and everything is like, it's crazy. Absolutely and crazy. And what's important about the Emmys, you know who really wins? The audience, because there's so much good stuff to watch. And here's the other reason the audience wins is because I think there's a lot of shows. I've talked to some people who are like, you know what? I've never even watched that, that, or that. I didn't know it was that good. And now they're going to go check it out. Yep. That's one of the great things about it. All right, what's next? This one's a two-parter, but we only received part one. Oh, oh, okay. Raymond Reddington says, what was your thoughts on the Lorca twist in Star Trek Discovery, Rob? I just finished season one, and I'm loving the show. I've been working my way through all the Star Trek shows and films. Well, look, is it interesting that he was from the Mirror Universe? Sure. You know, I like that. I thought that was interesting. Um, I actually really liked him as an actor. He's great in the are role. We t- are we talking about uh, uh, Malfoy's dad? Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. And he was, he's a great actor. Um, I'm just not a fan of the show, but I'm glad you are. Yeah. I, I like discovery much more than you do. Yeah. But strange new worlds is a a much superior show to it. I agree. uh, Than it is. Uh, I mean, I, I like it for what it was. It it, discovery does some, some strange things that I'm a little bit iffy on, but, uh, but strange new worlds took it to a new level. You know, I just read this great interview with Anson Mount where um, I, it was like yesterday, I think it was. Some of you guys might have seen it. I can't remember which outlet it was with. But they were talking about the things that makes his captain unique in the world of Star Trek captains. And what really makes his Pike unique is that in this long l- line of great Star Trek captains, you basically usually have the same kind of captain. This, the kind of captain that can say, don't worry, everybody. Mm-hmm. I've got this under control. And and they can step forward, whether it's Cisco or whether it's Picard or whether it's Kirk or whatever, Janeway, you know, that, that when shit's hitting the fan, they can put their foot down and say, uh-uh, not on my watch, right? And he talks about, I like how his character, Pike, and they've literally come out and said this for us, like, all right, uh, they're finding themselves in a pickle. All right, guys, I don't know what to do here. Ideas, best one wins, Go. And he talks about how it creates a true bridge crew that with each with their own strengths and abilities contributing to it and that he is a captain ends up being a captain that brings the best out and is able to leverage and utilize these great Starfleet officers around him. And it's not that that's better than the Picard or, or, or Kirk model of thing. It's just that it's different than what we've had. Archer was a little bit like that as yeah. well. There was a little bit of Ar- Archer in there too. So I kind of I kind of like that. That was a really good uh, interview with Anson Mount. I'm loving him as an actor. And I've never even seen, what's the one everybody talks about him being on? Hell on, Hell on, Hell on Wheels. Wheels. I never even saw Hell on Wheels, but I'm, I'm really starting to dig him as an actor. Mm-hmm. All right, what's next? Um, D- Dwan Williams said, also, I'm 90% certain that R went on that tour determined to turn down every suitor put before her, Renera like the rebellious teenager that she is. Well, I'm sure, you know what, that's absolutely true because she doesn't want to get married. No, but I don't think, like here's the thing, we as an audience never got to see a potentially worthy suitor in front of her. Right. We saw a guy who courted her grandmother (laughs) and then a child. Like that. that's all we saw. And then she just finally went, I give up. And- so, I mean, I don't, I think there was a part of her that was like, I get it. This is our responsibility. I am going to go on this tour. I will find myself, a, but she just couldn't bring herself to just accept to, to. Yeah, no, I, I also think she doesn't like, she's just not ready. She's not going to want to do it. She is a rebellious senior. She doesn't want to do it now. Right. But when, the, when it comes, when the king then says, that's it, you're marrying this guy and you're not going to bitch about it. Right. Then she's like fine but you're gonna lose the asshole fine <laughs> i think what's what they're not what the king's not taking into consideration is what the other people think he just assumes yes i'm here to offer you my daughter's hand in marriage and they're like okay 
not the king not realizing that there's a lot of scheming going on schemers schemers i i think this next episode is going to be so good oh yeah the preview I, for the next oh. episode looks bonkers but yeah it, it's oh yeah. i can't wait all right what's next all right that's it oh that's it all right guys and then that will do it for uh today's installment of open mic listen open mic will be back again tomorrow we uh we are not going to be doing pre-game shows for she hulk anymore until the season finale we will still do our after show on she hulk but hey listen if you've got some pre-game she hulk questions feel free to fire those in on open mic tomorrow so uh that's when rob and i will be back for that anyway rob in the meantime where can people follow you online uh you can find me on instagram at rm burnett find me on twitter burnett rm or find me at post geek singularity on youtube and post geek singularity.com on the web and by the way taylor has been back uh, there behind the control Hello, panel everybody. Ooh, it's dark uh, over here. <laughs> running uh running the thing back there today uh, jonathan started the show but he had to split so taylor's taken over done a good job thank in you in the meantime thank you jonathan or taylor and uh <laughs> i'm of course john campia thanks a lot for being here guys we'll see you tomorrow on the john campia show oh, oh oh what are we forgetting what are you doing tonight john oh yes tonight <laughs> Uh, we're going to wrap up the show. I'm going to finish up some things in my office. And I'm going to go home, and Ann and I are going to the Fox Theater, the historic Fox Theater in uh, Riverside, California. And I am going to meet Weird Al Yankovic tonight. It's something I've been too afraid to do. The many occasions I've had a chance to meet him. Now, how long have it been since you had the chance to first meet him? The first, it was at one of the Disney movie premieres. You know what? It might have been the force awakens i think he was at the force awakens premiere we were at the same buffet table and i just couldn't bring myself to do it and then at least five or six other times i've been in the same room with them and i just could never build up the gut scope so ann's got you a meet and greet yep she got me a meet and greet with weird al tonight do you know what you're gonna say no idea <laughs> i'm just gonna be but you're are you excited I mean, i'm super excited i mean look I, you got to understand, I have been in a room with Harrison Ford and go, oh, there's Harrison Ford. And I've walked right up to Harrison Ford and started talking to him. I, I did the same thing with George Lucas. I have no problem doing that, but I've never been able to build up the guts to walk up and talk to weird. I, I don't know why. I can't wait to hear what's going to happen. I can't wait to hear what's going to happen. I'll tell you, 90% chance is going to be, hello, Mr. Yankovic. Hi. And that'll be, that's all I can get out of my mouth, probably. You got to ask him about the movie. I hope to, but see, I'm already thinking in my head. No, no, no. Too many you people can't. are probably asking about the movie already. I, I, I don't want to irritate them. But no, you go up and say, "Hey, the, the, the response in Toronto was terrific. What do you think?" I, you got to do it. I'll freeze. I'll no, freeze. You I, won't. I, but I'll at least have a chance to meet him tonight. So that right. that I'm very excited. Well, about. I'm very excited for you. Yes, I'm very excited too. All right, guys, that will do it for us for today. Thanks a lot for being here, guys, and until tomorrow, my friends. Bye bye.